our next talk is going to be with Megan Erendrup, my friend from Denmark. So hopefully she is going to be joining us uh, by uh, Skype or Zoom or whatever technology she uses. Uh, so can Okay. Great. Great. Well, Meg, Meg. Hello from Denmark. This is Mike and Kevling Arendrup. I'm very sorry not to be at uh, the meeting in Albuquerque with you, but I hope this recorded presentation, and I'm not very used to do that, I hope that will work um, anyway. So I'm very first of a warm thank you for the invitation to speak today. I'm very uh, honored by the invitation. And I've been given the talk you see on this slide, but I've altered it a little bit so that it will be big messages from my fungal reference lab. And therefore, maybe it would be interesting for you to know what my fungal lab um, is for a kind of a lab. So this is the um, reference lab in, in, in Denmark. It's situated in Copenhagen. And on the uh, photograph from, from the air here, you see the campus of SSI in uh, the red, um, within the red lines. The three stars indicate the mycology lab. And as you see, we are, we are situated in quite beautiful surroundings. To the left, you see a photograph from the lab and two of my happy collaborators in the laboratory. The functions we have are threefold. We have routine functions, we have reference functions, and we do research. The routine function is that we serve the main hospital in Copenhagen. It's a tertiary hospital, so we do all their mycology, and therefore we have a range of, of routine tests you see to the right, uh, which includes the classical tests, and among that, 5,000 UCAST uh, plates a year. Uh, we do we have specific PCRs for candida, aspergillus, mucoralis, fusarium, dermatophytes, panfungal PCRs, and molecular tests for eukaryotic organisms. And we also go for resistance mutation detection whenever we have a phenotypically resistant species. We detect, we, we sequence FKS, SIP, uh, and SQLE. We also do the mold identification and susceptibility testing for the rest of Denmark, uh, except one university hospital. And then, of course, we have preferred samples as the reference function and do the surveillance program for candidemia and acyl resistant fumigators. And finally, our main research areas are epidemiology, diagnostics, resistance, and what all that relates to UCAST method development, ECOFs, and breakpoints. So this is what we do, and we also genotype whenever that's necessary. <clears throat> so with that ballast, um, we will go to what I see as the um, main problems in acquired resistance. And we start out with candida. And we start out with fluconazole and with glabrata, which is the organism among the most common ones that most easily get resistance to um, any sort of, of drug, so to say. And um, the resistance rate in the Danish surveillance program in candidemia isolates is 10%. And in blood isolates from a recent ECMM study we have just finalized, um, and which included almost all countries in Europe, the resistance uh, to fluconazole in, in glabrata was 14%. And it's basically not just a fluconazole resistant, it's also resistant to boriconazole, because in the diagram to the right, you can see the correlation between fluconazole MICs in the top and boriconazoles going down, both for glabata and uh, parapsilosis. And you see an almost linear relationship between the MICs. So whenever the MIC increases for flu, they also increase for, um, for boriconazole. Now, if you move to parapsilosis, then the picture is somewhat different because we don't see any um, notable resistance in, in the Danish program. But in the ECMM study, we had uh, one out of five isolates that were resistant to fluconazole, 21%. And this was due to, to a high resistance rate in parapsilosis in three countries specifically, in Turkey, Italy, and Greece. And outside this study, there has, over the far, past three years, also been reported uh, resistance in parapsilosis and also outbreaks in hospitals in Spain, California, Indiana, uh, Texas, South Korea, and India. And that's depicted in the purple or pink dots on the global map to the right. And these isolates shared, many of them shared 
a specific alteration in the ERC-11 um, targeting, a Y132F alteration, and many were clonal and also um, occurred in patients that had not received ASOLs as a sign of in-hospital transfer. And I think that is, is worrisome because, as you know, the number of, of drug classes in treatment of invasive fungal infections is quite limited. Now, if we move to candin resistance, then um, that has been reported over the past decade. And um, we are well aware that it's more common in Gerbata than it is in albicans. That has been shown in many studies and is also shown in the study here. Um, uh, that is in the top uh, two histograms where you see bars for Gerbata uh, resistance and bars to the right for albicans resistance. And it's, as you can appreciate, the bars are much higher for, uh, for inclabata than they are in albicans, and that's true both for fluconazole, anidula function, and mycofunction. What you also see is that it's more common in deep foci, it's the black bars, compared to blood, which are the red bars. And that has also been shown by uh, Neil Clancy, that abdominal foci is often a selection, select, selection nest and we have also shown um, in that, that in post-treatment isolates from mucosal surfaces, we see more resistance, far more resistance than we see in the bloodstream. And that's probably because uh, candins are big molecules, they're protein bound, and they will not be, uh, they, will, they will often be in sub-therapeutical uh, concentrations in more difficult to read foci. A troubling observation, um, and a very recent one, is uh, the emergence of a truly candin-resistant parapsilosis in Greece. Parapsilosis is an organism that is intrinsically less susceptible to uh, candins, but it's also very low virulence. So I basically thought that it didn't need to acquire uh, resistance on top of the already elevated MRCs compared to albicans. But um, as you see in, in the uh, table here, a res completely resistant isolate with MRCs higher than eight, which is the highest we normally test for, uh, for all three candidates and razor fungin was, was seen, and a, an alteration in the FKS1 hotspot one region, the first codon there was found. These isolates from this patient, three blood isolates, and then the resistant isolate in urine were, um, were isogenic. So it was a resistant that was uh, acquired during therapy in the patient. I think that just illustrates that resistance can emerge everywhere. We can't talk about uh, resistance in candida without talking about resistance in candida or RIS. And in Denmark, we're fortunate that we haven't seen very many uh, always cases. There, have, we have seen five or so over the uh, over the past year since the first one. So I'm definitely not an expert on this. But anyway, maybe the first case we had um, can be uh, fun for you to to see, and also was quite educational for me. It was a, a lady that was 65 years and uh, referred from South Africa, where she had uh, been admitted to hospital due to um, a traffic accident. So she was uh, wounded and she was referred back to, to Denmark. Uh, she was, we knew that she was colonized with Candida aureus and therefore she was isolated. And you can see the patient room here to the right. She was in one room, we served the neighbor room. These two rooms had a, a mutual entrance. We reserved that second room for surgical care for the patient and all the procedures that she needed and also uh, imaging so that she didn't need to leave this uh, part of the ICU to reduce the risk of, of having this um, organism spread among other patients. There were daily cleaning with chlorine uh, products. She didn't have any uh, fungal therapy because it was just colonization. And after uh, a month, she was transferred to uh, a surgical ward and um, during this entire period in the ICU, we had weekly screenings from, uh, of all patients and all were negative except this index patient. So after she fled the room, uh, left the room, ICU beds and rooms and entrance rooms were chlorine cleaned and we had a room disinfection as recommended uh, by CDC. And the room was left empty to the next day. Where a patient, uh, this time a man, a gentleman was admitted. He was in this same room for uh, five hours and he had no travel history. But because he was quite ill, he was referred to tertiary hospital in, in Copenhagen. 
And there over the, his stay, day one, four, 14, and 19, you had yeast detected in various non-invasive uh, samples and they were not speciated. Um, but he had a, a candida glabrata esophagitis that was verified from a biopsy. And due to that, he had a nilofungin therapy for two weeks. When he had been in this hospital for a month, he was returned to the first hospital and the day after, he was without antifungal therapy and he uh, became septic, he was blood cultured and we found candida auris. Probably you could guess that with, with the introduction to these slides. We find, found candida auris in his blood culture and a few days later also in various um, superficial uh, foci. During his stay, at, uh, or just after that, of course, uh, both in the first and the second hospital, weekly screenings were performed, but we didn't find any other patients that were colonized with auris in the next period. If we look at his isolates, then in the right here, you can see the genotype of the first patient isolate in the top and the three isolates we had from the gentleman in the bottom. And you can see that the genotype, nine markers investigated, were uh, the same. Among, across these two patients. So it was the first a transfer from the first patient to the second, despite the cleaning we've done. The only difference we found was that now the second isolate from this gentleman uh, or his isolates were completely candin resistant. And they also harbored a, a target gene ulceration at a well-known codon, as you can see below the table. Um, so we looked at his uh, MRCs to the different uh, compounds and he was put on ambisome because amphotericin B MRCs were one for these three isolates. So he was treated with ambisome and we have a follow up on him for one and a half months and there were no further positive cultures, but he, except that he remained positive for candida auris in urine and in uh, no swabs. Now, if you look into the literature for amphotericin BMICs, you will see that they are quite variable in different reports. And there is um, a study here from 2019 where MICs are summarized for a whole range of different studies conducted over time. And the blue bars here indicate the amphotericin BMICs and the red line, the uh, tentative breakpoint for ORIS um, of two. So some of these lines, they are ranges, they are completely below and all are, are deemed susceptible. Other ranges are just uh, all above the breakpoint, so all are resistant and some crosses the line. So it, it's total random, you could say, or, or, or very diff, different at least, um, resistant proportion in these different studies. And indeed, resistant proportions for amphotericin B go from, from zero to 60% in the literature. This is not about clades because the ones in the gray circles are all from India and they are also all over the place. Some of this may relate to uh, the methodology used for susceptibility testing. At least you can see here in, a, in one of these studies where amphotericin B was, um, was, was perform, testing was performed with CLSI, VITEC and E-test. And you can see the modal MRCs highlighted in yellow varied from one in CLSI and to, four, to um, eight in uh, VITEC with all isolates being classified as resistant in VITEC and almost all susceptible with E-test in the bottom, only a single one above. So that led to a very different classification of these same isolates when tested with different methods. There's also a very recent and worrying paper on, on ORIS that reported pan-drug resistance to, all, to four classes of antifungals. And here, uh, candin resistance emerged after 24 days and was supported by a detection of um, a well-known mutation in the target gene. Crucitosine resistant, resistance emerges after 25 days and again was confirmed by uh, four known alterations in four target genes. And finally, there was um, different classification of the amphotericin B uh, testing that were done for 19 isolates from this patient. And they're shown in the diagram uh, here with E-test results in the bottom, black, and track amphotericin B MICs in gray bars uh, in above the x-axis. And as you can see, if, you, if we adopt a breakpoint of one, then uh, all isolates are deemed resistant by TREC. And if we adopt the same breakpoint for um, E-test, and that's done in the paper, four isolates out of the 19 are resistant to amphotericin B. 
And um, these um, isolates were whole genome sequenced, and there were not detected any known resistance uh, in, in, in the target genes that we know for amphotericin B. Now, of course, that doesn't exclude that there could be unknown mutations somewhere causing a resistance. But if you look at the shape of the uh, histogram, you will see that this is a Gaussian distribution for the ETS results with the most on one and equal number of 0.75 uh, and two. And we have to, to accept that there is a phenotypical resist, uh, variation when we do uh, susceptibility testing. That is true for fungi, and that is true for bacteria. If you look at the diagram to the left, that's where we investigated the data, uh, 34 different Dribata isolates for fluconazole and had this, these MICs you see here. We took one of the isolates here from that had an MIC on two for the initial testing, and that was tested on every day uh, in the routine laboratory simultaneously with different Dribata isolates. And this was the MRCs for those, and this uh, for those repetitions of one initial Gravata isolates from here. So this is simply inherent variation of the test, and there is no difference in this true susceptibility between these isolates. Only when you leave these distribution, you, you can talk about resistance. And exactly the same here. It's this testing of clinical isolates, um, linicillid against Candida aureus, and this is a, an ATCC strain of Candida or, of Staphylococcus aureus tested in uh, the same laboratories, completely identical uh, distributions. So if you put a, a breakpoint like this through here, you will have random classification of isolates with the same uh, susceptibility. So I don't think there were any difference um, necessarily between the MICs on the um, amphotericin B MICs on the diagram before in the publication I just mentioned. But I do think that Candida auris is somewhat less susceptible than Candida gabbrata, for example, to amphotericin B, because if we compare MICs performed in our laboratory in 2017 for Indian isolates of Candida auris in the top here and gabbrata in the bottom, you will appreciate that the darkest orange colors were which indicates the modal MIC of these MIC distributions, that is higher for auris than it is for Gibraltar, one to two dilutions higher. So the population itself of auris is probably somewhat less susceptible to amphotericin B than Gibraltar, but, um, but we should be careful not to make a clandom a random classification of isolates due to variability in our susceptibility test. So what I think we need to do is that we have to agree if we actually regard wild type auris as an organism that can be treated or not. And if we regard it to be treatable, we need to select a breakpoint that will not bisect the wild type distribution. And we will then have to ensure that commercial tests are reproducible and that they align with the reference methods if we will adopt um, the breakpoint from either CLSI or UCAST. Now, with that, uh, I would like to move to, um, to Aspergillus and acquired resistance in Aspergillus. And the dominating problem here is, of course, acyl resistance, uh, which can be acquired both in, by the environmental route and the medical route. And I'm sure you are well aware of that. I have a global map here that included the publications I have found in uh, uh, by the end of last year. And all the dots represent findings of uh, environmental mutations in the different countries, so you see it's all over the planet. In the bottom, you see resistance rates in Danish studies with the oldest in the bottom and the newest in the top. And that's performed in our laboratory. And the ones that are encircled are CF patients in Copenhagen. So that's the same patient population. And you can appreciate that there has been a, an increase over the 10 years that is in between these two studies. And you can also appreciate that that's true both for the green bars that are environmental resistance and the orange bars that are uh, the, the resistance that is driven by medical use. And this environmental resistance in our country has, of course, prompted question, the question if every use of pesticide is equally harmful. I mean, we are an agricultural country and we have an agricultural lobby that is probably as strong as the um, gun lobby in the United States, I think. So there has been quite an interest if, if this is something that is um, that can be 
if we really have to stop any sort of pesticide use, if we want to to avoid this, or if if we if if we say that if just the, the Dutch people stop the stupid use for tulip production, we would all be fine. So therefore, that has prompted that we have done a lot of environmental studies. We have examined uh, fields, the soil there and air. We have sampled various produce, flower, um, the flower industry and potatoes. We've looked in par parks and gardens and examined flower beds there. We have looked at the soil near painted uh, surfaces because there's also easels uh, used in paint. And we've investigated manure heaps from horse stables and box bedding there. So you see, I, as a professor, is actually in deep sheets until the knees here, taking samples in one of these manure heaps. <clears throat> and basically, we have, uh, you can say, seek and you shall find. We have found acyl resistance aspergillus everywhere in all the samples that we have tested, but the numbers vary quite a lot, both by location, but also in the same location uh, from year to year. And I think, therefore, that is quite difficult to actually say, oh, here is a hot spot and here is not a hot spot, because whenever you sample, that will also be influenced by factors that influence the, um, the amount of aspergillus that thrive in that, uh, in, that hot, in that area, temperature, humidity, uh, if there's comp competing microorganisms, and how the nutrition concentration is for aspergillus there, how the acyl concentration is, if there's wind that blows other uh, susceptible resistance spores into that focus. So, so actually translating what you find in, in some, maybe a few uh, sampling sites, uh, or sampling um, times is to what is, the, is, is what we need to avoid is quite difficult. But what we definitely can say is that um, we do see overlaps between the isolates from the environment and those in patients. And that is also uh, what Matthew Fisher has reported by whole genome sequencing. Here we use straf typing and the dark red ones are uh, 34s in patients and or in the environment and the lighter ones are those that are in patients. So you see we have three dominating clusters and in all these clusters, they're both isolates from patients and from the environment. If we take the, th the third area where I think that resistance is really emerging, then it's in trichophyton and it relates to terpenophen. And, um, and we have in India a rate of 30% um, in, in trichophyton, and particularly in the species that's called Indotinia, a new species that is closely related to Intergetitalia and Mentacrophytus. But it's not limited to India. In the map of Europe, uh, um, it is depicted countries that re that uh, participated in a study where Dieter Sounte asked them if they had seen resistance, and the orange countries reported that they had. The grey countries didn't re didn't respond. The green country said they had no resistance whatsoever; they were sure, and the blue countries had previously reported resistance. So you see that in the vast majority where we have information we have seen to benefit resistance in, in dermatophytes. And of course, it's not life-threatening, but it's still quite cumbersome for the patients that have recalcitrant infections and sometimes on, on big areas of their body. We've also seen increase in Denmark, that's a histogram in the bottom, and involving both intertinia, intertitale, and rubrum. And that's despite we really don't test a lot um, uh, dermatophytes for, for susceptibility. It's not a routine test, but I think that we need to be aware that resistance is emerging here. So which, um, so which are the big challenges? Well, definitely we have an increasing number of vulnerable uh, patients, and that means more IFI, and it also means more IFI or invasive fungal infections with rare um, species that are often less susceptible to the more common one, and also moles like Fusaria mucoralis. We see in increasing acquired resistance, as I have just outlined. And we also see hospital selection and transfer of, of resistant organisms. And finally, we see it in the environment. So um, what do we need to do? Well, I think it's important that we, um, that we uh, shorten the time from uh, species identification, because that tells us about intrinsic resistance. 
um, and also the, the time to, uh, to, to susceptibility testing. And there are basic things that we need to do. We need to shorten transportation time and we need from, from the patient to, to the lab that do the testing. And we need to increase opening hours of uh, laboratories, at least uh, in many con uh, labs in Denmark where mycology testing is used. We can implement those who haven't done that Malditov uh, ID because that's quick. And we could also consider a lipid trans uh, transport medium um, to send isolates for antifungal susceptibility testing, because probably it would be possible then to avoid the primary culture on the plate before you can run this susceptibility test. You also definitely need to broaden the use and access to resistance screening and to susceptibility testing and to introduce PCR for samples much more than we do today, because we also have options to do uh, direct resistance detection. Um, we have developed a screening test, and that's uh, for, for acyl resistance in, in fumigators, and that's based on porphyrase initial work. And that's now as a com commercial test. And it's also, um, there's a method described at the UCAST website. And it's a very easy test to do because no growth on the acyl containing agas, but growth on the control well in two days means that you have a susceptible organism and any growth is indicates resistance. The test has also been developed to detect candin resistance where, where um, aberrant growth is the endpoint because it's not a sidal drug. So if you have uh, growth on the anidula or mycophagin containing wells that is set with halos around the, uh, the disc and or the disc-like growth in the middle, just like in the in the no drug well, then 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 again you have a resistant organism. But we also de introduce vector photometer reading for most uh, microdilution plates in UCAS, and that really means that you can read them in an ELISA reader, and therefore that you don't have the same need for mycology experience when you read the plates. And if only one a commercial company would produce these plates for, for testing, it would be easy to introduce them in more routine laboratories because it would allow a spectrophotometer reading, not only for, for yeast, but also for aspergillus, phanfotericin B and ASL, and also for trichophyton testing. And with these methods, um, there are breakpoints. And then I will, of course, not review all the ECOFs and breakpoints that are summarized here, but uh, they can guide uh, therapy. And for the more rare yeast, we have um, published a pragmatic approach to how we can approach MRC interpretation for rare yeast where we will never have enough data, clinical outcome data, MRC clinical outcome data to set uh, true breakpoints. But if we as assume that the rare yeasts uh, are less um, virulent because otherwise they would be as common as the more common ones, then we can probably be safe as long as the MICs are in the range of the susceptible organism we know. So we classify the different species according to their MIC and thereby um, also taking guideline at, um, recommendation into account and, and, and verifying our MIC ranges by looking at the literature. We have classified the different rare yeast into categories where uh, you either can treat that's those in green, where you can consider uh, um, using the agents if the infections are not severe or if you don't have any other options or a step down therapy, that's the ones in orange, or you should consider a different therapy, that's when they are red. So I think this can be helpful in interpreting MICs for the rare species where we don't have great points. We've also published uh, an overview of how to use molecular detection of antifungal resistance, which summarizes both in-house tests and they, those that are commercially available. And in this document, there are also guidance on which um, alterations will elevate the MICs to what degree. So I think this is helpful and could, could ease implementation in all laboratories, which, which would be helpful. Now, it is, of course, important to, to realize that um, molecular detection can diagnose resistance, but not susceptibility, because new alterations can emerge that are not detected by these assays. We also, in, in, in addition to the things I've also already mentioned, we also need to improve the performance when we use commercial tests. And I think it's important to, um, to guide laboratories on what they, they need to do when they implement a test. 
because not all tests perform perfectly. Here are um, essential agreement proportions between e-test and UCAST for Canada. And the green ones are very nice uh, correlations and agreement. The red ones are awful and those in orange are in the middle. And I, I suppose we can agree that the, it's quite colorful, this table, indicating it's not perfect. This is also true for molds. Uh, no surprises here. So what laboratories need to do if they implement a commercial test is that they first test UCAST uh, or, or quality control strains 10 times each and ensure that the most common MIC for these repetitive testing for their QC strains is in the middle of the target range that are reported by the reference test. And if that is true, then proceed with 10 isolates of each of the common species and see that the MICs here also mirror the MIC distributions used by the reference methods for setting the breakpoints. Our data are available on the website, so you can easily see if the MICs are within the center of the MIC distributions on the website. If that is true, then you're probably safe on using your commercial method. So that, that is what you really need to do, but you also, we, we, of course, also need to strengthen antifungal stewardship and infection control to avoid spread of resistance and to limit further development of resistance. We need, as I mentioned, to say if we decide or risk is treatable or not to amphotericin B. And finally, I also want to say that we need to avoid or limit the use of identical drug classes in medicine and environment. And this is particularly important for ASOLs, of course, but also for the newly developed olorofim, where uh, an, an other DHO, DH HEMA has just been introduced in the environment in the US. And that is just a nightmare in my view. So with that, I would really uh, warmly thank you for your attention um, and Again, apologize that I was not able to be uh, present in person in Albuquerque, but I also really want to thank all the collaborators I've been blessed to work with, both in UCAST and also elsewhere. And with that, um, I'll thank you for your attention. Okay. So